tremendous crowds which you see gathered outside the stock exchange are due to the greatest crash in the history of the New York Stock Exchange in market prices. December 31st, New Year's Eve. The crash and its terrible consequences were still in the future. Financial leaders, everyone, celebrated what had been a decade of prosperity and boundless optimism. They thought the party would last forever. They called it the New Era. Nineteen twenty-nine. All the hope and promise and illusion of the 20s converged in that one year. The United States is afflicted with new eras. Let us not think for a moment that the uh, illusion, the uh, aberration of the 1920s was unique. It is intimately a part of the American character. The mood of the era, I think, can best be remembered by the hit song. Was that 1929, uh, Blue Skies? In the 20s, yes. Blue 20, Skies. 20, smiling at me. Yeah. Nothing, Nothing but, but blue, blue skies, skies do I, do I see. see. Yes. Never saw the sun shining so bright. Never saw things going so right. Gray days, all of them gone. Nothing but blue skies from the moon. Nothing but blue skies from the moon. That was the whole uh, tenor of the day. I mean, people believed that everything was going to be great always. Always. There was a feeling of optimism in the air that you cannot even describe today. And everybody seemed to uh, have uh, an interest in the stock market. Certainly the uh, boot black, uh, the tailor, the grocer uh, owned shares of one kind or another. This was the first time that many ordinary Americans had begun to invest in stocks. A stock, a share of a company, is bought and sold here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. The stocks themselves have no fixed value. As in an auction, if the stock is in demand, its price goes up. No demand, and the price goes down. For almost eight straight years, stock values had been rising. By 1929, there seemed to be no upper limits in this world of paper, numbers, and dreams. It was an arena of unbounded opportunity where somebody like my grandfather could come into it and make a fortune. So many people made so much money in the, the market that late in the 20s, it, it seemed that uh, you just couldn't go wrong buying stocks in American companies. Here was a whole new way to make a fortune. Unlike the Carnegies and the Rockefellers of previous decades who built steel mills and dug oil wells, Men like Michael Meehan, Jesse Livermore, and Charles Mitchell had amassed their fortunes buying and selling stocks, pieces of paper. The public was fascinated. Bankers, brokers, and speculators had become celebrities, and they lived like royalty. I can hardly believe that a family lived in this kind of a house. I mean, today it would be almost unbelievable six stories and these great big rooms enormous <laughs> we counted it up the other day we had uh, 16 live-in help in this house not aside counting the chauffeurs and others. not counting the <laughs> chauffeurs yeah. uh, aside from all the help we had in the tuxedo park house and the southampton house as well but those days are gone forever I but we never thought of it as being grandiose because practically everybody we knew seemed to live in the same way. Josie Livermore had a ticker tape in every home that he owned. 
they had a beautiful house on 76th Street in Manhattan on the west side off Central Park. They had a floor at 813 Fifth Avenue because Dorothea did not like to go to the west side to change her clothes. So they had a house in Great Neck. They had a summer house in Lake Placid. They had a house in Palm Beach. They had a private railroad car, uh, two yachts. Oh, they lived. They really lived. Few Americans lived like Jesse Livermore, but there was a rising expectation that everyone could have a piece of this prosperity. During his presidential campaign of 1928, candidate Herbert Hoover would make this extraordinary promise. Given a chance to go forward with the policies of the last eight years, we shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this nation. There was great hope. America came out of World War I with a, the economy intact. We were the only strong country in the world. The dollar was king. We had a very popular president in the middle of the decade, Calvin Coolidge, and an even more popular one elected in 1928, Herbert Hoover. So uh, things looked pretty good. The economy was changing in this new America. It was the dawn of the consumer revolution. New inventions, mass marketing, factories turning out amazing products like radios, rayon, air conditioners, underarm deodorant. This is a period in which the American household gets the washing machine, gets the refrigerator, uh, goes off gas light and gets electricity in some cities. This is a period in which people would buy little plugs to put into the uh, outlets in the wall so the electricity wouldn't leak on the floor. What will they think of next was a 1920 saying. This new things were continually coming out. And there were new things which you could enjoy, not just for the few. One of the most wondrous inventions of the age was consumer credit. Before 1920, the average worker couldn't borrow money. By 1929, buy now, pay later had become a way of life. So uh, there were changes, many changes in the way people viewed the world, and all of them optimistic. You extrapolate the curve, and what do you have? Permanent prosperity. That was a term, a term one heard in the late 1920s. We entered an age of permanent prosperity. Wall Street got the credit for this prosperity, and Wall Street was dominated by just a small group of wealthy men. Rarely in the history of this nation had so much raw power been concentrated in the hands of a few businessmen, men like William C. Durant. It's almost impossible to realize the power and the significance of the men. Uh, in Flint, when Mr. Durant came to Flint occasionally, people used to say, Durant is in town. Just like that, Durant is in town. He was uh, bigger than life. Earlier in the century, Durant had founded General Motors. Now, he made his money on Wall Street. Backed by Midwestern auto industrialists, he controlled so much money that he could single-handedly drive up the price of a stock and then sell, reaping huge profits. He was just at the apotheosis, at the maximum of his power. He managed, according to the voices of the time, according to what was said, anywhere between two to five billion dollars, which in those days was fabulous. The market was filled with bulls, and he was the bull of the bulls. Durant came to Wall Street as one of the titans of industry. Jesse Livermore, whose fortune was estimated at over $100 million, never did anything in his life but play the market. Everything Jesse Livermore touched turned to gold, it seemed. All he had to do was to press a button and the stock would go up 10 points. And uh, that meant, of course, that Jesse Livermore would make a lot of money. So 
the average American would look at this and say, gee, I, if, I, if only I knew what he was doing, I could make money too. How do you get in on Jesse Livermore's brains? Livermore was a speculator, pure and simple. He didn't study the health of a company. He didn't care whether it made a profit or paid a dividend. For him, 